everyone, my name is Tori and welcome to another episode of the World Ethnography Project. Here we discuss the lives of people all over the world through reviewing ethnographic works. During this week's session, we will be discussing an ethnography by Nebraska native Dr. Tom Belsdorf called The Gay Archipelago, Sexuality and Nation in Indonesia. As a member of the LGBTQ community, I was so excited to dig into this book, and I was not disappointed. We will briefly discuss the author himself before diving into a breakdown of the ethnographic work and much of what a future reader can expect from such an interesting read regarding the queer community of the Indonesian archipelago. book discusses how globalization and relations between nations in more diplomatic ways intersect human sexuality and gender expression in the Indonesian archipelago. Published in 2005, the history of the gay archipelago dates back to about 13 years prior in 1992, though Bellstorff states that this particular book is based primarily on fieldwork conducted within a 10-month period between July 1997 and May 1998. The themes of the book fit right into Bellstorff's main topics of study, including, but not limited to, the anthropology of globalization, Southeast Asian studies, and the anthropology of sexuality. Engaging in participant studies with gay and lesbian people allowed Bellstorff to redefine his own definitions of sexuality in regions outside of the Western world. Through his research, this author finds that the queer experience is not as universal as one might assume. In other words, Drag Race hasn't quite made it to the archipelago, but the gay community in Indonesia makes do with their own drag performances. As for the contents of the gay archipelago, Bellsdorf paints a complex picture of the relationship between globalization and human sexuality in Indonesia. After a brief introduction to italicized Indonesian terms that would be used throughout the book, Bellstorff starts off with an honest response to the initial reaction of an eager, uninformed reader. If you have opened this book hoping for a traveler's tale in gay Indonesia, you might be disappointed. In other words, this may not be the next YA novel turned summer blockbuster. This is not an Indonesian Love Simon situation. But fear not anthropologists to YA lovers, Bellstorff quickly reassures contemporary readers that the book can still be enjoyed regardless of experience in the anthropological field. Throughout the first two chapters, Bellstorff introduces audiences to gay and lesbian culture in Indonesia. How the people who identify as gay and lesbian define themselves within Indonesian culture, and how Western ideas of sexuality are not as universal as Westerners might think. A major theme of the ethnography is that while ideas can come from miles beyond a country's origin, ideas adapt and become unique to a region of the world through the integration of ideas into the ever-changing concept of culture. Succinctly, Bellsdorf defines this phenomenon as dubbing culture and uses this phrase as an intersection between globalization and the effects of globalization on gay and lesbian culture in Indonesia. Moving along, the author also devotes a chapter of the ethnography to the complicated relationship between gay and lesbian Indonesians and relationships, romantic and internal, particularly the heteronormative societal expectations that are placed upon these individuals and those with gender identities that fall outside of the typical binary. From short-lived marriages often forced by societal standards to girlfriends used to conceal one's sexuality, fitting into a box is still expected, even if the box does not fit the person. Though there are ways for the queer community of Indonesia to express and affirm these non-heteronormative identities without pursuing romantic relationships, Bellstorff spends the fifth chapter of the book discussing the gay scene in Indonesia and the fluidity of such a place. No one can simply point to a map and find a gay scene of any country, let alone Indonesia, because, much like Western culture, deviants from the cultural norm are often pushed into hiding in underground places and being unrecognizable in plain sight. 
Bellasdorf mentions on page 134 that normal Indonesians usually walk past a group of men in a park or mall without recognizing they have passed through a node of the gay world. Noticed or not, the queer community of Indonesia still exists. Though gay and lesbian people can truly thrive in pockets of the hidden world of the gay scene. Through gay nights at nightclubs and stolen moments in the apartments, queer individuals in Indonesia can express themselves without persecution. In the sixth chapter of the book, Bellstorp expands upon the expression of sexuality and identity in non-sexual ways, while also formally introducing the audience to non-binary gender identities such as tomboy and waria. The thin line between lesbi and transgender is also brought up, as the author points out that, for some, finding where sexuality stops and gender identity begins can be a difficult task. Some people in the queer community of Indonesia may not feel as though they fit into just one box. Additionally, Bellstorff paints this occurrence as normal and prevalent in the lesbian tomboy community, as he quotes a tomboy as saying, I don't feel like a woman. I don't feel like a man. And most of my lesbian friends feel this way. Gender and sexuality are separate and yet intertwined. In the penultimate chapter of the book, Bellstorff blatantly defines how interactions between the state and the citizens have shaped, or reshaped, what being gay and lesbian means to queer people in Indonesia. The author finds that in the early post-political era of the island nation, Indonesia government officials began to redefine togetherness in the country in an attempt to break away from colonial practices that came before. One of these methods was through the concept of familyness, a primary way to connect Indonesians to one another and a government of people who are of the same flesh and bone. Through this family-making process, though, a definition of normal debuts and puts those who do not fit into this new normal into the category of other. The idea of a heteronormative nuclear family with a male breadwinner and a female homemaker and children began to symbolize a stable Indonesia and balanced social order within the nation. This idea is then dubbed into the children of the archipelago, normal, gay, and lesbian alike. In gay and lesbian culture, heterosexual marriages are normalized to avoid family and community shame. Bellsdorf also points out the differences between gay and lesbian culture in Indonesia and gay culture in the Western world. While queer people in the West may feel a desire to declare non-heteronormative identities, the same cannot be said for queer individuals in Indonesia. Two different worlds and different cultures can bring about differences in senses of self and how those senses can be expressed and reaffirmed. Finally, in the eighth and final chapter of the book, Bellsdorf summarizes dubbing culture in Indonesia in regards to gay and lesbian people once again, and brings the concepts of the book full circle. The gay and lesbian experience the author finds is both individual and communal within the island nation in a way that simply does not translate to a global scale. Though queer culture within Indonesia may be influenced by Western ideas, the culture has become unique to the region and has spurred a sense of national pride within queer Indonesian individuals. Homophobia and heterosexism, or the belief that heterosexuality is superior to all other sexualities, was still prevalent at the time of publishing, forcing a need for national acceptance into the gay and lesbian experience as well. Even in the face of such adversity, Bellstore finds a way to end the book on a positive and hopeful note. To be gay and lesbian in Indonesia is to be a part of a created culture, and that experience cannot be put aside. In my opinion, in order to truly understand a book, a person must become familiar with the content as written. Today I will be reading and commentating on one of my favorite excerpts from the Gay Archipelago. What makes gay and lesbian subjectivity authentic is not uniformity over all domains of life, but participation in the gay and lesbian world. 
an island of life that does not necessarily have implications for other islands of life. Such subjectivities are the kind of homosexuality that dominant Western frameworks see as immature or inauthentic. They are often labeled as situational, as if sexuality, like all domains of life, is not always contextual. The expectation is that sexuality must be confessed everywhere. But gay and lesbian subjectivities are archipelic in that their authenticity does not require denouncing other subjectivities. Continuing on to the following page. To be gay and lesbian, one open oneself to the gay and lesbian world. But for most gay and lesbian Indonesians, there is no sense that one should ideally open oneself to the world in general. This is why, for so many gay and lesbian Indonesians, the desire to marry heterosexually does not contradict a sense of being gay or lesbian, and is not understood as bisexuality. The idea of multiple, fractal, or individual subjectivities can be shaped by traditional discourses, as well as those of the nation state. However, the ethnographic data support the conclusion that a particular form of multiplicity in gay and lesbian lives has been formed by dubbing Western notions of homosexual selfhood with national discourse, as exemplified by the archipelago concept. Personally, this section of the book helped me truly differentiate the experiences of the Western queer community and the experiences of gay and lesbian Indonesians. The idea of expressing one's sexuality outside of definitional terms is seen as a betrayal by Western standards, as Belstorff points out in the excerpt. However, even as a queer Westerner myself, I don't see sexual fluidity and compartmentalization as a betrayal, but rather as a different form of expression of sexuality and identity. Much of what I have learned in class and from reading this book have helped me reshape my perspective of how human sexuality and gender identity is expressed. Human expression encompasses a range, or spectrum, if you will, of actions and emotions that don't have to negate the subject of the expression in order to validate the subject for the expressor. And, as Belsdorf points out many times throughout the book, the Western experience is not universal. Even though I have spent a lot of time singing the praises of the written work Dr. Belsdorf has done in Indonesia, no book is without fault. In my opinion, the Gay Archipelago has a lot of relatable storylines and good information. But the journey to get to the investing content is a little bit long. Even as a member of the LGBTQ community, in a few aspects, I found myself unable to dig into the book during the first chapter. Even with a bit more anthropological knowledge than the average reader, I was still looking for a little less jargon and a little more storytelling. Though I can't say I wasn't warned, I am sure that for the intended audience, this book had the perfect balance of jargon, information, and entertainment. First, learning that gay and lesbian Indonesians are comfortable marrying the opposite sex caused culture shock. But as I kept reading, I came to understand the reasoning behind the comfort. Expectations for citizens are different in different regions of the world. This was an important theme to remember as I read the book, and I can definitely apply this lesson to other parts of my life as I continue to learn in the future. Thank you so much, dear audience, for tuning into this episode of the World Ethnography Project. I hope you enjoyed the show and my creative retelling and critiques of The Gay Archipelago, Sexuality, and Nation by Tom Belstorff. Tune into the next episode of the World Ethnography Project to learn more about the lives of even more people all over the world. 